Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and excited to have you join us, join us on this episode. If you are watching from our Facebook channel or our YouTube channel, uh, we want to welcome you to the video version and invite you to make uh, comments below as the podcast episode uh, goes forward. If you make comments, we'll be able to um, correspond and interact as you uh, comment and uh, leave your suggestions and, and thoughts. And that'll give us an opportunity to have a real-time discussion. And if you're joining us on the audio version through one of our uh, audio podcast players like Stitcher, uh, Apple, or Google Play, or one, any of the others, iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, I that was the one, uh, iHeartRadio or any of your other podcast providers, uh, we invite you to subscribe to the channel. By subscribing, you will get first uh, look at our content ex um, exactly and as quickly as we get it released. So you'll be able to uh, take advantage of uh, the episodes and not miss a single one of them. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to uh, take a look at the intersection of sexuality and reality where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. So again, we want to thank you for joining us on this episode. Today's episode is really unique. It's one that I have uh, wanted to put together for quite some time. And finally, uh, schedules worked out well that we were able to get... Um, Judy Mayer on the podcast today. Now, if you're not familiar with who Judy is, uh, she, not only is she a spitfire, um, <laughs> she is just a charming, wonderful person who has uh, done a lot for uh, not only the LGBTQ cause, but also for the cause of Mormonism. Um, she, she's an artist who has painted um, some of the most familiar works of art. Uh, that are being displayed even today at, um, at Temple Square in Salt Lake City. She has uh, sat with prophets. Um, she has worked with church leadership to bring that talent um, to Mormonism and to the world as a whole. So we want to welcome to the podcast Judy Mayer, and thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. Okay. You'll have to say Judith Mayer, though. Because that's how they would know me. Ju it's, they're all signed Judith Mayer, huh? Yes. Perfect. But Judy's how I am to my friends. So you guys, it could be Judy. We want to welcome to the podcast Judith Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I don't know. I want to talk art, and then I want to talk your, your whole story. But let's first, maybe we'll put art in the middle. Okay. Um, because... For those who are watching on the video version, we uh, will be able to show you what uh, those paintings look like. And I guess if you're listening on the audio version, you'll have to jump over to the website uh, at latterdaystories.org and we'll post uh, that footage there, some pictures there, so people can see the paintings that we're talking about. But most of them are going to be familiar already, because I even remember uh, one of your paintings, the, the one at the Family History Library, on a bookmark in seminary. Right. Um, oh, really? Yeah. The big the, mural? The big mural. You one. had a bookmark? I did. It was. All right. And on the back of it, it just talked, uh, there was a quote about family history. Right. And, uh, connecting your ancestors together. And yep. So that, that hung in my scriptures. In fact, I think I even still have it in my mission scriptures. Oh, God. All these years later. Wow. So what an influence. Well. See, I, I had no was, idea. That was my whole dream as a, a young person growing up anyway to be able to use my talents in the building up of the kingdom of God on the earth. That was my whole motivation. Well, it worked. Believe it or not. I took your art all the way to the, uh, the desolate lands of Michigan on my mission. Oh, okay. And carried it all around. So let's start first. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, who Judy is. Well, I grew up in California. Um, San Francisco Bay Area, and went to school there, and uh, w always was interested in art, and was an active LDS person, Mor not Mormon. We, we don't use that word anymore. You were Mormon then, but now yeah, you're, right. now we're Latter-day Saints. It's whatever, yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's hard to change how we describe things and use terms. It just is. In so many ways. Especially when it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. I know. Well, yeah. so I grew up active. I always knew I had a talent. I had art in high school, got a scholarship, and went to BYU, graduated with a degree from BYU in art, 
and just had it in my mind that somehow or other I was going to use my talents to help build up the you know, kingdom of God. When I was at college, there was this art and faith movement of a bunch of artists that were uh, interested in doing that. And we were always debating on how to do it and what things. Um, so that's what I pursued and uh, finally was able to start doing things for the church in about 1978. How, how is it that you started uh, did you apply? Uh, did they, did well, they see I knew, something? I, I, um, I actually donated a painting at the time uh, to uh, the church because I felt really strongly that, that that would be a good introduction. And if they needed to use me on, you know, subsequent things. So, and one of, and the painting is now in the Relief Society building. It's the woman uh, t canning and tending to the food storage. That's been quite, it was quite used in the Relief Society uh, lesson manuals and things. So that was the one you donated mm -hmm. and now it's uh, widely distributed. Yeah, well, oh, it, well it, it was my introduction to uh, to show them my talents and and then I met people and some really good friends in that and they at the time were just starting the art department and the this was before the Museum of Church History and Art was even finished being built and so they had all these plans and Florence Jacobson was in charge of it and um, so it was all just a whole new thing where they were going to start incorporating art and, and featuring art to show how uh, that benefited and helped you know, spread the gospel. Helped tell the story. Right. So your story has a um, LGBT twist to it. Oh, yes. Where, well, where does that come in? Um, at, at what point does uh, Judy's story start or contain something that identifies on the LGBT spectrum? Well, when I was in high school, I had a compartmentalized thoughts about myself. In my fantasies, I would uh, dress up in old uh, coonskin outfits like Davy Crockett, and I would go court some nice librarian and I always, and I actually always after the drew, risk takers. I always I actually drew a whole <laughs> little storyboard with these little characters myself as a disguised little guy. But um, I didn't think much about it at the time because I still intended to be married and have children just like every other Mormon girl. Um, so those were kind of my early things that maybe I wasn't quite the normal girly girl mm -hmm. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't a girly girl like my sisters and so uh, in college when I was having feelings for women or my my fr friends that were just way stronger than any of the feelings I was having for the guys I was going out with and you know and sitting there making out with a guy and it wasn't doing anything for me it was like what <laughs> so I just thought I hadn't met Mr. Wright for some reason, Miss, when Mr. Wright came along, I was going to feel something a whole lot better. I think that's a, that's a very common reaction. Yeah, a, a lot, especially in Mormonism, where a lot of people will say, "Oh, well, it just wasn't the right person." Then I guess right. I'll wait for the next one. Right. So that's what I expected. I didn't really consider that I was anything other than, you know, just me. And I hadn't met Mr. Wright yet. But of course, you can't go to the thoughts that you might be one of those, ever. The unholy, non-sacred word, that lesbian Yeah, word. you can't go be anything that's a homosexual in your thoughts or else you will think you were like, oh, wait, I don't, I don't really feel like that about myself. I'm not that bad. God didn't make me that, that bad. So when you discover that about yourself, you really do have those tendencies, then you're like, 
you go through, I went through about a period of 10 or 12 years where I was very distraught that I would have any of those inclinations. So we're, uh, time period wise, we're late 60s, early 70s? Um, I'd say when I started to worry about it, it would have been after college, well, at the end of college, probably 74 on into the 80s, because I still was waiting for Mr. Wright, and I had really strong feelings for certain females that I, we were just so close, and I thought that, I mean, I knew that was from God, because it you don't feel those kinds of feelings of love for somebody if you weren't really like, you know, soulmates types of things, but I can't, you know, I wasn't looking at it as being a valid thing for uh, coupling. I mean, I, I didn't even allow it to be a thought that that was a gay thing or a homosexual thing or whatever. I just thought it was we were just really close, so uh, you know, friends from the pre-earth life even. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's another great... Uh, I don't want to say excuse, but some, something that people will use often saying, well, we probably were just best friends in the premortal existence. Right. And that, that's that great bond. Right. Um, and so I, I was very naive as far as, you know, that. Um, at one point, there was a, an incident where one of my roommates and I, who were very close, um, later she left and went back to her home and then she wrote me and says we can never see each other again and you need to go see the bishop we hadn't done anything but because of our she, her father was a state president i guess she told him something so there there was a there was a connection there oh yeah and um and i went in and talked to my bishop and he said well just why don't you go learn how to wear makeup and you can't and don't take the sacrament for six months so he had you 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 had come out to your bishop well I had come and I'd said this I, I told him because she told me to go see my bishop and I said well I didn't you know and I went and I told him I said I don't know what's going on here um, and he said well why don't you just start wearing more makeup and so you can be attractive basically to the opposite sex? <laughs> uh, take on more feminine roles. Yeah, be more feminine mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, uh, and meanwhile, don't take the sacrament for six months. Like, uh, like I'm going to repent for whatever I didn't, didn't do. do. So, and that this will solve everything, right? Yeah, yeah. and then I could... <laughs> make sure that I get myself in tune with the Spirit. By making sure you didn't take the sacrament. Right. Uh -huh. Makes perfect sense. Mm. Anyway, it was very distressing and I felt very sinful and I felt very evil and like, what is going on with me? Why? What? But at the same time, I didn't do any, hadn't done anything. So. <laughs> so this is college, college roommate? Yes. Um, only a single incident, or did you just start developing relationships for other women? Well, later, I had another, other friendships that were very intense, and I kept wondering, what the heck is this, you know? And um, on one of them, she ended it because she probably thought it wasn't going to be a good idea to continue being friends. So all us Mormons who can't handle whatever it is, we just take ourselves out of it. Until in the 80s, uh, I met somebody uh, who there was no way that I couldn't recognize what was happening, especially because she said to me, and, and, and she's the one who had already been married and divorced, she said, well, this is exactly how it feels when you fall in love. And I thought, uh, no, no, we're just, we're just really special. 
We just have this bond. No, this is how it feels when you fall in love. And then I thought, uh. <laughs> I'm in love. <laughs> I got, okay, so then I thought I had to flee. I had to flee because, you know, you can't get yourself into trouble there. Let's talk about society at the time because right. you're, t um, well, in the 80s, this was. Yeah, we have a lot going on. We have Anita Bryant. Right. We have yeah. um, the AIDS epidemic happening. Right. So, and it, and that that originated there in California. So that's a lot of hometown stuff going on. Yeah, well, I news. was in Utah by then. Right, but yeah. you're familiar with. Oh yeah, you're familiar a with all that. Oh, Probably absolutely. People that you know as well. Oh, oh de definitely. Um, Carolyn Pearson's oh, yes. um, experience was happening within and Mormonism. And that was so distressing to us. It was so amazing and distressing at the same time. So with all the social things happening and, and things that were happening in that, that era, how did you react? How was that making you feel? Did that further push you into the closet? <sighs> My mom, I had, I don't know where she got this from, but before any of this, somewhere in the 80s, she had given me th this book called Born That Way. Mm -hmm with a question mark on the end. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, but it was about a Mormon girl who who'd, was a same-sex attracted person who had relationships. She was also a, a drug abuser and all this stuff and all that. And then she went through this whole bunch of machinations and scripture reading and gnashing and wailing and, you know, to get herself back to being straight. Unsame-sex un attractive. Right, yeah. and then she got married. So this book, so uh, my mom had given it to me, so I thought, okay, mom, I'll read it. So I was reading it and I thought, wow, somebody has, you, you have to go through all that? You have to do all these steps? All this fasting and scripture reading and over and over and, and, and you know, basically like the old Catholics had to crawl up the rocky steps in, in bleed and to, in order to get themselves out of sin. And, and I felt somehow or other that I was not that bad of a person when I finally allowed myself to realize that I was actually same-sex attracted or a lesbian, or whatever you want. I, I had to come to terms with, well, I don't, I don't feel like I'm so condemned. And then an amazing thing happened to me where God told me he loved me just like I was. Oh, that's probably a great part of this podcast. Right, well, and that, and that was like, because I had gone through this you know, this whole analogy in my head that I was down there when I figured out I was gay, way lower than everybody else, and that the only way to get back up to being equal to them was this horrible process that I'd read about in that book, but also that I thought you had to do, and I thought, this just doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like God, you know, wants me to do that and he and okay some people want to say she but you know <laughs> I don't care I'm just calling him he because that's how I've referred to him forever um, just whammed me with you're okay especially when and this comes right around the time I painted that Howard Hunter painting and that's part of this and I'll tell you about it if you want. Yeah, let's, we'll talk about it. Let's talk about the art in, uh, in just a minute. Um, I want to try to understand, so we have, we have what's going on in society, AIDS epidemic, not a favorable um, yeah, situation the, to, to even come out. It was very difficult to come out. Or the whole public understanding of what being gay is. All about sal salacious, you know, really unpleasant sexual innuendo and, and all that, you know, all the stuff that my parents or anybody would assume if you're gay, you're a pervert. Yeah, and the picture I want to paint here is the majority of the listeners of this podcast right now um, are completely unfamiliar with your era. They, they didn't grow up in it. 
um, its history, it's, it's in, well in the past, and, and often they'll look at the, the situations we're in in society today and still feel depressed and down and saying we aren't making much progress. But when you were going through it, uh, the roads weren't even paved. No, and you were, if you were gay, you were like the scum of the earth. And if you read Kimball's book, and that's the, the other part of this I wanted to bring in. The church was doing so much. The, everything that indicated that you, if you were at all gay whatsoever, that you were just a lost child of God. The, and the thing, the important part to bring up at that point is um, even the even the messaging from the church has changed. Um, the church now brings in this this idea that if you're acting on it, then that's the sin, but in the late '60s and early '70s, just being just it. being a homosexual because at was BYU the, they had re reparations. I mean, not repar reparative repar reparative therapy, and I know some guys who they had to go through that in order to, you know, and and that you had to be changed. Period. There was no option. You could not be gay, no matter what. Your bishop would tell you, "Oh, go get married to a woman." to, you know, fix To combat yourself. or to fix. Yeah, right. Ernest Wilkinson, the Wilkinson Center, right. the, B the BYU Center is named after, um, even uh, stood at the Marriott Center, wasn't Marriott Center then, uh, but gave a BYU devotional and said, if there are any homosexuals that are here on campus, if you'll make yourself known, come to the office, we'll refund your tuition, and uh, we'll exit you out of the school because we do not want to be, his words, uh, we do not want to contaminate or be contaminated by your presence. Yeah. So that was the era of BYU, reparative therapy, shock therapy. They were trying yeah. to un-gay people. And um, I was actually, uh, I was an RA, resident assistant in the dorms in my sophomore year. And the dorm mother asked me to spy on a couple of ladies that were suspicious of being a lesbians and it was like I was supposed to go listen to the little phone box to see if I could hear anything going on in there so we could catch them and I just I don't know how that was the most horrible feeling thing <laughs> that I'd ever done and unfortunately I never heard anything so I could not report anything I'd knock on wood. And would you have really reported it? I don't know. It? I don't want to think I woulda, but I don't know. So interesting. Yeah. Um, well, that honor code office is sneaky as all get out anyway. Right. Yeah, they are their own little monster. I mean, I had an argument with a guy from Arizona State about the blacks and the priesthood thing. Which is another, I mean, that's 1978. And that was before the that had been changed. And I argued the church's position to the best of my ability. And the more I argued with him, the more I kept thinking, this is not defendable. <laughs> and it, it was just this whole thing about none of this is defendable. This is just what am I doing? So the whole of it, all of it, it's all these things. We had to, I tried to defend the church in every way possible, but then the more you c tried, the worse it just didn't fit. The ship just kept taking on water. Right. Yeah. So, so you, you're out to your mom. You've had the discussion with the bishop. You've created a few relationships. Uh, you've worked your way through college. You've mitigated social issues. You've tried to right the ship in terms of religious issues. Um, and really, there's nobody on your side. Um, there's not a lot of people who are uh, rolling out a red carpet saying, it's okay to be gay. Nobody wants you to be gay. I mean, gays didn't want to be gay. It doesn't matter. Back then, if you were gay, it was just one of those really, really, really horribly unfortunate things. And somehow or other in the next life, you'd get fixed. Yeah, another great point, which was another great a great Mormon message right. that the resurrection will fix all these things. This is just a mortal experience. Right. And so if you have to be celibate during this life, you can be with those rest of those other handicapped people. 
I think that's another great point because, yeah, and the handicap, that's, we should discuss that. Uh, another great point is that uh, that was the, pu- the, the great push for mixed orientation of marriages within the church. Um, today, the church is pushing this idea of celibacy as, as a compassionate way of dealing with uh, same-sex attractiveness. But in your era, they were pushing celibacy, but realized celibacy wasn't favorable, so they were pushing people into mixed orientation marriages saying, no, we need relationships. Right. You need someone to love. Right. You need to build a family. So it's not celibacy that is the answer. It's the mixed orientation marriage. And that's, that was the direction. It's funny that now... The, yeah, they're, the, they're taking out the, the part where, yeah, you can't have a companion. You can't have the companion. We don't want you to have the, the loving relationship. You don't, you, Therefore, you can stay be, celibate. Yeah, you can be a truncated person. Basically, if you're gay, you don't get to have the full... Uh, interaction with some companion where you learn how to serve love and all the other things that other people do so okay but just think you won't you won't fall into this eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we'll die uh, scenario anymore so it's a blessing for all the LGBT people oh the yeah church. so we get to we get to the point where you're uh, you're somewhat out um, uh, at least to a few people and now you're starting to build some relationships uh, you said you met somebody that you undeniably knew that right. there was we, a relationship. We both became, she, she, she had, hadn't been with, she had not been in love with a woman. And she, she was a divorcee and had four kids. And we just, there's just something that happened between us. And then we both knew we were in love with each other. And uh, what do you do with that, you know? So I felt like, okay, hmm, I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to St. George, which is where my parents were living at the time. Um, I, it basically, I knew I had to flee to avoid um, getting in trouble. Her? Yeah, flee her. And so when I decided to do that, because I was going to maintain my good status as a Mormon, you know, uh, because I was painting for the church. I was working, painting wonderful paintings, you know, and and I believe, you know, deeply in the gospel and and all of that. And, um, And then all of a sudden, Heavenly Father told me, no, you stay right here. You stay right here and you go help my servant. And he named her and help her raise her kids. So how did that work? Um, ah. Well, because well. I still had to maintain being in the closet. So I had a house and she had a house two blocks away from each other. I'd go help her with her kids. We'd take them to church. I taught Sunday school. We did stuff. Um, after the, after the, the ward that I was in, uh, finally realized one day, uh, okay, so they, you know, you, you kind of get the looks from, you know, different people about you, you kind of being a little strange and whatnot. Um, when they find, when they found out I was that Judith Mayer, that artist that they'd seen all the stuff in and the in the magazines and, oh yeah, okay, you can be quirky, you can be weird. We're gonna let you because you're you're this Judith Mayer. You have street cred. That's right. So then that was fine, everybody was fine and we just went along for 27 years. 27 years. (laughs) Well, okay, not the whole time I wasn't in the church. After a certain point in the early 2000s, I just couldn't do it anymore, but. So, uh, describe what your relationship looked like. Um, to whom? I was Aunt Judy. Aunt Judy to the kids? Uh-huh. Aunt Judy to the kids. I was just a, but her, her helper because she was a divorcee. And, you know, it was good that I came over mower lawn or, or you know, uh, clean her carpet with the carpet, uh, you know, rented carpet cleaner or whatever, you know, whatever. I had my work belt. <laughs> I was a bit, I'm a bit of a, a, a um, masculine-ish 
Well, version. back to David Crockett. And you know, I, I built, I used to be a construction worker back in the day, too. So, building houses. So, see, it's, it's just following but, stereotypes. What kind of, yeah, I know, <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, I don't know what it looked like. We tried to hide it. What do you think it looked like to the church members? What was your intention? Uh, how were you masking we weren't, it? We were just friends. I was... We, I was the famous Judith Mayer artist for the church, and she was, you know, just a single mom with four kids, and we were, I was helping her raise them, buddies, you know, mm -hmm. however they looked at it. You didn't give them anything to worry about. I tried not to. So um, let's, let's jump into the art, because I mean, that's probably a great segue. Uh, you had submitted a piece of art to the church. The church ends up commissioning uh, you. Um, talk about a few, what, what was your first commissioned painting for the church? Probably a portrait. It was, maybe, I wasn't, I'm not sure if it was the portrait of Spencer, when was Spencer W. Kimball? It was one of those portraits. I did a couple of early, I, I did some drawings and some things of, oh, Matthias Cowley, an old apostle, just some portraits and things like that. Uh, Florence Jacobson wanted me to do a painting uh, of a party of saints in the 1800s in the social hall. I never did get that painting done, but uh, I think the first paintings that I did for the church were a bunch of portraits of general authorities. Um, and then you had, uh, if I remember right, you had some in the gospel library kit. Right. And um, the, those uh, came in the 90s, probably. Probably some of them in the 90s. Um, I did a bunch for the Sunday School lesson manuals. Um, they're, the ones in the kit are the uh, Moses and the Brazen Serpent. I did things for the Relief Society, like the Ruth and Naomi paint you know they're I'm not really sure on which le you know where they where they, they were, were all in. <laughs> 25 years over uh, you know in the 80s I did that big mural yeah let's so uh, we'll put that up on the screen let's talk a little bit about this one um, this is the uh, this is the painting that's hanging at the uh, family history center right uh, the family history library uh, just uh, west of the Salt Lake City Temple uh, right. right at Temple Square and it's hanging up um, in the stairway right above the entrance desk. It used desk. to be, yeah, it used to be in the lobby as you entered, but they've remodeled it recently in the last couple of years, and now it's up the stairs in another upstairs lobby. Yep, so uh, easy to find. So tell us a little bit, of, uh, what's some uh, unique features? What do we, uh, sometimes well, artists throw in some fun things in a painting. Anything I special did. in this one? Uh-huh. This painting has 74 figures in it. Um, and it was supposed to depict, you know, the history of mankind through, you know, through the pre-earth life and to the post-earth life and a family togetherness thing. And in the 80s, when they wanted uh, to get this for the new building, the family history library that was being built, they had a competition among artists to do mock-ups of this theme families are forever kind of thing. And so a bunch of us artists submitted um, little mock-ups and they went through them and picked me at the, you know, to, to do a more finished, me and one other guy, my, a teacher, <laughs> BYU teacher, professor, to do one, because I ended up being like, we're competing. And eventually I won the competition. Of course. Basically. Yeah. Um, but at the time, they were telling me to, at the time my mock-up had Adam and Eve a little bit more prominent and a few fig leaves covering them. And they decided um, they didn't want any naked picture people, to, even if they were covered, <laughs> you know, in there. So later in my actual finished version, I put Adam and Eve in there who's and naked, but they're at the very top and you can't tell. Interesting. But they're naked. <laughs> and nobody picked it out. Huh? No. 
And then one of, uh, and then at one point painting that mural, Marky Peterson came in and said, the, um, or, Jesus needs to have white hair and no beard. And I thought, well, I thought later that if I took if I took brown hair off of Jesus and off and took his beard off and just put white hair that nobody knew, would know who that was. <laughs> so I didn't do it. And Marky Peterson at the time, uh, member of the first presidency? I mean, it's been a long time for me to know what position. Uh -huh. So uh, how did you, how do you overrule an apostle? Well, you just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, I just... That's it didn't do it. On other occasions when Hartman Rector Jr. came in there and said and told me how to do the the prints on his on Jesus's hands and arm versus the way I had them, I did follow them cuz I thought, "Oh my gosh, yeah, why that that's exactly it." I mean, you want to know what he said? Yeah, I'm oh. very interested. Okay. Well, I had just regular scars and he said, well, why would Jesus have scars? Why, what, what, why would he have scars? He, if, he, if, you, if he has a wound, he could just not have scars, if he, you know. So if he's going to show you his wounds, why wouldn't they be? The wound. The wound. So I thought, oh, right. So I painted my not too bloody, because he said, well, you know, it's not a Catholic picture <laughs> where it's all bleeding. And, we but, don't want to scare all the Maya maids. But I put wounds, raw wounds, on the Jesus depiction. That leads me to another thought. Um, the inspiration for a lot of these paintings, um, is that Judy's inspiration? Is uh, um, were, Was ever, maybe, here, here, this is going to be a very leading question, because what I want to try to get at is, there's a lot of controversy, controversy right now in the church about uh, some of the paintings depicting things that aren't factually correct in terms of the restoration. Um, Joseph translating directly from gold plates when now the church has updated uh -huh. uh, that, that uh, gospel art to show that he's looking into a hat with the rock and the stone. Right. Um, did they say, Judy, this is how you have to paint? Or were you, were there ever paintings that you painted that are now historically inaccurate based on something the church has said? Um, or did you ever receive direction from the church to paint something that you also thought, uh, this, this maybe isn't correct? Well, when I was doing the Joseph Smith um, giving the, uh, at the point where he was revealing the, the restoration of the church, there's a painting called Joseph Smith Speaking by Inspiration or something that shows Joseph and then Oliver Cowdery's writing it down. They did direct what they wanted to show in that painting. And a lot of the paintings they did direct, like the one where Nephi's vision of the Virgin Mary, they just wanted it to, to have a sort of, of a sense that, that they art directed it towards. But in general, um, other than the Marky Peterson, just, you know, that I didn't follow. I didn't really, and then, but there was a really, really good thing that, so um, I think it was Richard G. Scott who came in and saw the mural. And at the time, everything was just regular white people. And he did look at it and he said, well, you know, why can't we have, I, I think we'd have more, you know, diversity <laughs> and so is there a way to add um, depictions of, of different races in here and I thought oh yeah oh great you guys want that you know because that's not ha but I thought okay so then uh, I went about changing a bunch of the characters that I'd had formerly been just white people into you know all the races 
in the here in the hereafter and in the pre-earth life. The the little family that was representing the family, I couldn't really like mix them up. mix them up because you know, <laughs> but because we already had a problem with interracial marriages in the church at the time, so we, we couldn't do that. So it was just you know, but I was really happy to hear them want to add things that I would have loved to have put in from the beginning, but didn't really think that, it, you know, because that's not, that wasn't part of my thinking, which it is now, but it wouldn't, wasn't then. Yeah. Let's take a look at this one. This is uh, Howard W. Hunter. Oh, man. You know, so that experience ha happened right at the right time for me because that was right at the time I was finding out for sure that I was queer. And uh, when I got the call to paint his portrait, I, you know, we go in and we meet them and, we, and I go in to photograph them, to, to get them, you know, pose them. And we're not gonna sit there and paint them while, but I need to photograph them. This was right after I discovered and like, okay, I'm, I'm gay, you know. And I thought, well, oh, I'm going into the office of an apostle. I wonder what he's going to see, you know. You kind of get worried about, okay, you know, are you going to be in Behold trouble? The, win the windows of heaven will open up and right. all things will be. Yeah. Yeah. So I go into his office to photograph him, and he immediately just sends this bolt of intense, pure love at me. Like, it just like hit me like this most amazing sense of pure love. I had never experienced that before in my life. And I was like, you know, wow. And I thought, oh. So then I was able to really feel pretty good <laughs> about going and posing him and photographing him and getting him the right thing. So I, I and he, he had this most beautiful expression. And, I, and, I, and so when I photographed him and then I painted him, I thought I've just somehow got to get capture that. Um, and, and, and yeah, the painting's not perfect, and there are so many things I would redo if I could, but I think his face in there has that expression and is really how he was feeling to me. You were able to paint love. Yeah, I hope. I felt it. I felt like, though, I don't know how to express how that sense of being accepted and, and loved, like in, like, so purely just plain love you f you felt did you feel like he knew well what you I were don't, going through at that time I don't know I didn't I didn't try to analyze whether it was because of that I, I just felt absolutely accepted and loved in whatever state I was like there was no judgment of me of anything just pure acceptance I think a lot of people are would be envious of that opportunity. Well, I, it's what it, everyone wants. It's what people need. It's what every single person needs to feel like, uh, oh, I, I'm okay. I'm not broken. Yeah. I'm not alone. Right. And that my best days are ahead. Right. So okay, that just helped me feel um, like there was okay. I was okay. And I, when he bit, did become prophet later, and he was only a prophet for eight months, That's right. I had this fantasy somehow that he was going to, maybe he would have a special dispensation or a, a something for gay people to be able to get married. I just had this fantasy. You, did you attribute it to that experience you had with him? That there was Yeah, that, that I thought he had the ability to get it, to understand it, and he, and to have that sense of, us. So I knew I knew God had that sense of us because 
And so subsequently after I'd gone through all this stuff and I started to understand that God loved me just like I was, I started to say, well, why? Okay, you're telling me this stuff about myself. Why can't other people know? Why don't they know that? Why don't your servants know that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I couldn't figure out why God would tell me I was okay and that he wouldn't express that and tell that to other authoritarian, I mean authority, uh, authority pick figures. Mm -hmm. So to understand the timeline, um, you're, I mean, you're deeply entrenched. Your occupation at this point is commissioning paintings for the church. Like, uh, the church yeah, I was doing, doing other paintings, paintings too in society. I mean, selling them. So an artist. Yeah, you're employed an as an artist. Um, you're in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, closeted. Very closeted relationship, but you're not out searching. Um, there, you're not out looking for addition, an additional relationship. No. You, you're, you're comfortable. Um, those needs are being met uh, in that relationship. Uh, what is your, where are you at in terms of um, testimony and feeling towards the church? the acceptance of who and what I am compared to the doctrine that's being taught. Let's kind of venture down that path and kind of unpack how that was working well, in your world. Because God was talking to me at the same time I was in this weird situation, which was quite a difficult thing of trying to how to figure out how to navigate, in my opinion, because, you know, sure, I was having problems with, okay, why can't we have a little bit less patriarchy, you know, misogyny issues, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, there are a lot of things that then you start wondering, well, okay, if I know something about it, why don't they? They are and, special witnesses of Christ. They should. Yeah, they should have it. What, what's with this? But at the same time, I was deeply and committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and my sense of how that taught me to love and want to serve. And I still have, a, a, to this day, I have a great reverence and love and hope and testimony in that whole thing. So for for me, I had to kind of like, okay, here's this structure, the, the church, Here's how I'm starting to view God's actual expectation. It's much broader than that little box structure. And so it started to open my mind about looking at all kinds of stuff. And I started to learn all kinds of different things and look at people differently and and understand how, um, when you come down to it, it's just the the central command is to love God and to love His children and serve. And so all the other things started to become a little extraneous to me. Until November 2015. Well, before before that, I in the early 2000s, the the the, the pain was too much for me to continue to go to church and to pretend to be this this way and have this relationship over here. So I just couldn't handle that pain anymore, and I took myself out of the church. Um, not out of a closet, and my partner continued to go to church for a while. Her ki The kids were grown up now. They went off and did their thing, um, but at the same time, she couldn't come out of the closet because of her family issues and stuff, and wasn't ready to. And so, um, even though I couldn't go to church anymore, we still were in the closet until the November 2015 thing. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it. Okay, when at, at that point I had started to go to a different congregation uh, to just for because of some friends, and it, it was a non-denominational kind of congregation 
who didn't have a dogma or a, a but it had a humanitarian component, and so uh, that felt pretty good. Um, but when the November 2015 policy thing happened, that just like sent me over. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. So gay people were then going to be apostates. They're going to have this label, apostate. And all my whole life I thought, the apostate thing was the worst thing you could possibly be. And then to all of a sudden have that attached to you just because you're in a relationship with somebody else who you love... <laughs> I just like that. And plus, the kid thing. You know, the, the no baptism and the kids can't do this and they're, until they're 18 and they have to disavow their parents, things that I thought. My first thought was this was going to cause kids who come up and discover who they are. I thought I had it bad when I discovered who I was as the worst person in the world. But when a kid, when they have that codified, as apostasy and this is what it is and you're such a horrible person that you are now removed as a whole unit of a people out take this whole group of people just dump you five percent of the population or whatever the percentage is who are this way it it just it just just blew my mind second thought all of a sudden was oh, I'm an apostate and they're gonna th what about my artwork mm. what a, what are they gonna do they can't have apostate artwork all over what are they gonna tear down all my artwork so I just freaked out and I thought oh I have to go in the closet even deeper you know at the at the at first but then after talking to a couple of my friends who were gay and finding out what their families were starting to do to some of their relatives and other people, I thought, no, this is, this is bad. These, you know, and the kids, there really is. So I thought, is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do? Um, and then I thought, Oh, well, I'm sort of famous. I'm sort of, I have sort of a little mod modest reputation. What if I, what if I came out and begged them not to hate their relatives and told them that there's a bunch of us gay people who are in the church and painting and doing stuff and... The answer was to come out. Yeah, so I did. I wrote that op-ed that came out in the Tribune in January of 2016. Um, outing myself by s saying, hey guys, I'm a church artist, I've done this, blah, 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 but hey, I'm also a lesbian, and I didn't say that word, because you can't use that word anyway, it's like... So I'm gay? I, I, I'm same-sex attracted? I, I don't remember how I put it, but it wasn't, I didn't use the word lesbian. I think it was said, I said homosexual in there. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatic. <laughs> Trying. To. Anyway, uh, so I did, and I tried to be as loving sounding in, as possible, but I was trying to say to you people, please, your kids and your gay relatives and your everybody, we're all out here, and you know, you need to love us. And I'm just worried about the suicides and the young, tender ones. How did it go over? Really well, really well. I mean, people, I mean, it was amazing how, like, okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't get any negative anything, except for my aunt who said, Judy, we all knew you were gay. Why'd you have to come out and say that publicly? <laughs> She's in Mississippi. <laughs> So you got the, uh, the bulk of your pushback was your own family that, um, well, obviously they it figured was, it out. Yeah, they'd already known. I mean, it's not like it was a secret. 
I mean, it was sort of a secret, but... You couldn't pull the wool over their eyes just being well, the I mean, quirky I mean, artist that... No, and I mean, I had already told some of my relatives anyway a long time ago, but um, it was just so... It was very helpful, and I felt so empowered, and I felt so free, and I felt so right. It felt... I, 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 I do attribute writing that op-ed to having a really intense sense of spiritual affirmation that I needed to write it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it made an impact um, to the church? Um, was did they did they continue using you for? Well, art? I hadn't been painting. I hadn't been painting for the church since like the early two thousands, so it didn't. It wasn't anything new on that score. I don't know what they thought. They didn't take the paintings down. They're still there today. Yeah, they are. So they, Although one of the, so, I, very sad to, I, I'm not w sure why, but one of the Sunday school paintings ended up in a thrift store somewhere. Really? Yeah, how that happened, I don't know. <laughs> Did you buy it back? Well, no, a friend bought it, and that's how I found out about it. So, But, you know, I, I hate to see that, hey, if you guys have any paintings of mine out there... <laughs> I don't want them ending up in the thrift store. <laughs> They're far too valuable to well, yeah. show up at a desert well, industry. They, that's not the first one. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if the church just goes through some they liquidation. Clean, they clean up them, and they, I don't know, maybe they give them to people, and the people die or something, and they get put in a estate sale or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, and then they look and then they end up at the DI and they're like, we never heard of this. Was it Judith Mayer? Right. Uh, and then uh -huh. off they go. Right. Wow. And they're really good paintings too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a little biased, of course. Well, oh, I'm so okay. Um, unrelated, but maybe we should at least talk about it. You had two paintings stolen. I did. And one of them was recovered. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because well, I thought that was a fascinating story. Well, it's so sad that I has, still have one painting out there that's not recovered. And I don't know if it ended up in the dumpster or at somebody's house somewhere. But it's huge. It's three feet by six feet. And that was without the frame. I mean, you know, it's it's framed. It's huge. Yeah, a year ago almost, in December, um, they just somebody was breaking into various um, storage lockers in my apartment building and removed okay camping equipment and everything else but also these two really huge paintings what are they thinking i don't know but one of the paintings was recovered uh, in a an apartment of a guy who was killed when he was breaking into somebody else's house yeah he was breaking into someone's home and they shot and killed him yeah the whole uh, in self-defense right and then when they went back to this man's apartment, the, the burglar. Right. There the was police discovered, well, this painting doesn't quite look like it should be here or whatever. And they looked on the back and they looked up in the records. And yeah, there it was, me, stolen. <laughs> so I got one back and I'm so happy. It's like a symbol. Um, but maybe the whereabouts of the other one died well, with I that Well, I thought man. that possibly the fact that they connected... They could find connections and find it, but um, I don't know how well that worked out with the police or anything, connecting up other other places. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fascinating because the I know the uh, like, it got pretty decent coverage. I know media coverage. Peggy Flat, uh, Fletcher Stack put it on. Uh, -huh. uh Wrote the article about it. Let's talk about where Judy's at today. Ah, uh, yes. Well, that's probably the final part of. The, the, the part that's still being painted. Yeah. So I, I'm painting things that have to do with social statements right now, too, a lot. And I care a lot about different humanitarian issues. Um, and I still have this great sense of love and belief in... God and Jesus Christ and the whole aspect that I, I'm still a Mormon in my soul in so many ways. Um, okay, I don't, you know, the term Mormon, I know we have this issue, but 
I don't care. It's just the way it is. For for sake of um, how long it would take us to say it, it's yeah, easier I know. just to say you're Mormon. Right. Yeah. Um, but at the same point, I attend a, a the Unitarian Universalist Society. It's a church that doesn't require you to believe in a dogma of any kind. So I can take my Mormon beliefs there, and we're just a community that loves and serves each other and the greater community in a lot of different ways. And so it's not possible for me to go to a Mormon church and other than to baptisms and whatnot because I can't, it hurts, it pains, it's, it's painful all the time. General conference is painful. I'm doing stuff now where I went to uh, and did a, a panel in a ward of, with different uh, LGBTQ people and we talked to the regular members of that ward and it was really really good because they are thirsty to know who we are. They want the stories. They, they want, want to, understand. to understand. And they they all helped and 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 said we love this. We love this. We need to do this more. I don't know very many people who want to just who will live the, for the whole of their lives in the manner in which the church would like them to live if they're gay i mean el queer whatever i just know that I'll, I'll, most of the people i know are getting their own personal revelation about who they are and how they need to live and that overwhelmingly uh includes a relationship yes because i know heavenly father has also talk to me about who I am and how eternal I am as this person. And he has shown me my own path and my own eternal companionship with a person of my own sex. So that's just the way it is. What is your message to Maybe before I ask the question, I was at a at an event um, a week ago and met a 76 year old woman um, who has been closeted her whole life, um, and says it's not worth me coming out anymore. I am not going to be able to make a difference, and the the pain and just the acknowledgement of of acknowledging who and what I am to the world just doesn't mean anything. How do you respond to someone like that who, who still feels or thinks that I'm, I'm too old now to come out? Um, I'm too old to be honest and authentic. I think that until you actually do it, like something triggered me to do it. I, the, the November 2015 devastating policy triggered this because it was going to be so abhorrent and so dangerous. And so I probably was out-ish, non, you know, not out, out in the public, but to all my friends, they already knew. Um, but at the same time, when you still had to, like, you know, not talk about it around somebody. When I did come out and recognize that, oh, I'm just going to be who I am, there was such a powerful sense of freedom and like, oh, I, I, I can just be me. I don't have to fake anything anymore. And so when I go to meetings now and I happen to be sitting there with a bunch of Mormons, and we're talking about my artwork from the church, and then they're asking me where, what ward I'm in or now or whatever, and I'm saying, well, no, I don't go anymore. And then they ask, well, oh, and I, well, I'm gay. You know, I just say, well, I'm gay. And, oh, yeah, okay. Because you, know, you can say you're gay now, and everybody knows that's why you don't go. Okay, you, can, you, you can't, you don't, nobody cares. Mm. <laughs> you can, okay, yeah, you can't go because you're gay, you know. <laughs> Unfortunate, but I get it. Yeah. No, I mean, but but that's how members of the church are. They understand that if you're gay, 
you have an excuse, basically. I mean, in a, in a way, they they they're okay. I'm sorry, but you know, basically, that's true. You can't really go. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. What is your advice to um, to other church lead, uh, church members and leaders who are trying to better understand this topic? Uh, what can we do better? What can they do better? Well, let me just finish the one before I get that. For her, the lady who's 76, to say that, all I'm saying is it's a, an individual thing. And if, and, and if she's comfortable not coming out, well, that's fine. But when you do come out, you're so free. free. You, you become so much more like, okay, because not only did God say I was okay f as I am, when you come out and you admit it to other people, you are telling yourself, I am okay as I am. So it's, it's empowering to you for yourself to, to um, hold it. I don't know how to say these things. Yeah, each Sunday at, uh, on the Latter-day Stories blog, we post a coming out story, and I have uh, paid attention to the many of them that say how they looked in the mirror, and the first time they ever said the word gay or lesbian, I am gay. Right. How empowering that was. Often, the very first coming out experience is the one in the mirror, where you, right. where you have to acknowledge who and what I am. Right. Um, so I get it. I understand that. So when we go to talk to leaders of the church, or anybody like that, and we're just going to say that we are gay and that God said that we were perfect just as we are. And <laughs> then, then we look at them and we say, hmm, so in light of that, <laughs> what are you going to tell me? That you can't tell me that I don't know that I'm loved just as I am, that, um, that my own uh, experience with Heavenly Father and all of those powerful spiritual things, and I'm not kidding how many of gay peoples and lesbians and others that I know who've had personal witnesses and experience with deity about themselves, how do you tell us that we have to be truncated in our lives? You can't. Oh. That great Mormon message that you will lose uh, happiness uh, you'll have a lack of spiritual experiences and no blessings on this side of the aisle just has not panned out. It's not true. And, and I have to admit that when I was in the closet before I was ever, I was worried about that. I was worried that if I got exed and I lost the spirit that I would be devastated because the spirit is so important to me. And, you know, I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know how long it'll take, but eventually I think they'll, they'll know. But it's unfortunate because this is PTSD every six months or every time something comes up in the news. And our youth and our middle-aged and our mixed orientation marriages, our friends are collateral damage in this. Yeah. And that's the reality. Yeah, it's totally. And, and, and I thought that, um, you know, John Gustav Rathal mm -hmm. said a really important thing about uh, the church and, have, and loving the church and the problem with the, the fact that we're gay and loving the church is that we're not accepted. I mean, we can't have the joy of the gospel that other members can have in the church because of, of how we are. And so he felt like it was really, that was the tragedy because we look at the church and, and the gospel as being so good, but we can't have it. We can't be part of it. Which it just reminds me of the quote from um, Elder Ballard uh, in t uh, 2017 where he said, I believe the LGBT community has a place in the kingdom. And that's as far as he could go because right. there wasn't an explanation as to where right. that where place was. Right, where do they was. fit? Yeah, and so we've, 
we've really hung out in a lurch. Yeah. And then this recent general conference, Oak says, it's definitely not the celestial kingdom if you're going to act on it. So um, to the message that, that that sends to the LGBT community is that your attraction has made you unworthy for the celestial kingdom. So you get to hang out with Hitler and other great people. Well, that's tough. Well, it's really tough, especially when you get your own stuff from Heavenly Father. And so, who do you believe? It's contrary like, to personal revelation. Like somebody exactly else a great was point. writing in their blogs on, like, well, then I'm not going to be able to believe any of my spiritual experiences in my whole life if the one that told me I'm really good as I am as a gay person uh, is isn't true. True, because that negates every other spiritual experience because they're all kind of the same you know what it is when it is which ties into the reason why uh, sur surrounding this topic the LGBT topic alone so many people have left the church over it it's because you, right. you uproot the whole foundation right it goes to the very core of your belief when you start talking about personal revelation and when you bring in this seal of living reality where someone that you know personally is impacted by this topic it changes your mind completely and, and because of that, whole families are right. leaving. Well, half of the congregation that I go to at the Unitarian Universalist Church over there are ex-Mormons because of the same kind of thing. Yeah, I, I see it in all spaces. Um, because I, I advocate in a lot of different places for the LGBT community, and I see it over and over and over again. We left the church because of this topic. It was because of November 2015. I had a daughter that came out. I have a son that's trans. Mm. And I see it over and over and over again. That that personal revelation, which I think is beautiful, uh, it, it is trumping the general revelation. And right now the church just doesn't know how to handle that. Well, The messaging isn't there, the, at least. The only thing I can say, too, that's hopeful in so many ways is that this is not going to be stopped or reversed. Because young people know the difference. And it's just going to continue to grow, and we're going to become known. Um, and, and the church is w well aware of that. As Elder Holland just recently spoke at a, a group of seminary teachers and uh, institute-aged people and was concerned that they are, the youth of the church are becoming too favorable <laughs> to the LGBT community. Well, yeah, right. And, that, and that's, that's a problem. That's a threat to let's the church. Let's be not favorable to LGBTQ people. Yeah. Oh, no, let's love our LGBTQ people, but let's not be too favorable. That's right. <laughs> uh, we have an unconditional love. We love, but that's really difficult. So I think my point in that is that uh, the members see through that, and they're, they're able to... Uh, they're able to ascertain and understand something that uh, is important to us. Well, I just hope and pray for more members to not use this division to kick their kids out of the helm or to say you can't hang out with uh, your other siblings because you might influence them incorrectly or so many things that I witnessed other people doing that's right and it's it's just tragic when that has to occur for what I look forward to the day where n no one has to worry about coming out there is no coming out process I know it's just it's just you show up and say here's who I love right here's who I'm in relationship with I look forward to the day where we don't need uh, in circle houses mm. uh, I look forward to the day where we don't even need this podcast or to have a discussion every six months or a tirade every six months about um, the LGBT community. Because what is the point? Are they going to really try? Well, okay, the November 2015 policy basically tried to extricate that segment out. Just take it out. Purify the church, whatever. Which, which isn't the first time they've tried to do that. Yeah. So when they three year, three and a half years later, reversed that whole thing. And they used, in the first place they used the term revelation, then the second time they used it. And I know they're trying to finagle how they want to use this term, but that was devastating to me. The fact that I revere revelation so intensely, 
the, it, it almost just, you know, made a mockery of that term. It's interesting, timing-wise, the revelation was announced uh, January 2016, at the same time as your op-ed. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because they were having too much problems going on with the brethren not liking that policy. That's right. They had to clamp down and say, you guys, it's a revelation. you got to go for it. That was Nelson in Hawaii who spoke and said that it was <sighs> yeah, a revelation. And that was a devastating time period for me. Yeah. Just thought that was interesting. That, that I know. Well, that's true. That's well, that time period. So Interesting. Maybe that op-ed. I don't know. Once again, that doesn't have Judith nobody, Mayer. nobody. I'm an obscure little artist. She you is. Know, it was just no, I was a nobody. Change the dial again. Oh, right, not. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's so many of you all out there who are doing this work all over the place. It's just out there, which I appreciate so much. But. It's so freeing and so empowering, and it's so wonderful to know I'm loved by Heavenly Father as myself. And I don't, I don't have to worry that I was the scum of the earth. Because you're not. No, but that's what we thought. That's right. Anyone who navigates this topic feels that level of um, inadequ inadequacy and, and shame and guilt. Um, it seems so... It seems so common, and and I think your point about uh, the message showing up in in various spaces, it's being heard. I mean, this podcast alone, yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That's an amazing. Thing. Tens of thousands of people, um, in some episodes. Wow. That are paying attention to this message, and um, that's important. It means that there are people who are interested. I mean, look at who all's coming out lately. Ed Smart out of the blue. Yeah. I mean, who thought? I mean, out there. I mean, just I'm just talking about different people, and 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 people just say, okay, I'm not going to keep in the closet anymore. This is too important. It, it, yeah, and it means that we've we've lowered the temperature enough that people are now comfortable uh, entering into that water, right. and and I'm happy to invite them into the pool. The water's great. Come and I in. feel really sad about the friend, you know, the the 76 year old woman. I I hope she can find some peace about that. Yeah, me too. And I encouraged her to come out. Uh, the, the fact that she's not overly closeted, like we had a conversation, but uh, she, she sought me out because of this space saying, right. uh, essentially, I'm a, I'm a safe space. So she was able to, to, to have that discussion. But I want, more, I want more people like her to come out. Right. Because My, older people are gay too. That's right. And, and sometimes you think old dogs just can't learn new tricks. And I say... <laughs> there's no better time to be authentic and honest and find that freeing experience because it opens up a whole new world, a whole new group of friends and experiences. And I, I just think of all the things that are now involved. I've lost some friends. I lost some associates and acquaintances, but the world that I've, hmm. I've, that's been open to me, right. a new group of friends, new experiences. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Right. It's just, it's just a, it's just part of being a human being, able to uh, ex expect that there's diversity. And look at all the different things out there in the world. Look at the different races and the different religions and the different everything. Why can't there be a different sexuality or a different gender thing? I mean, it's just... There is, and that exists. We just need to be more comfortable yeah, with it. It's just amazing that... that God, in my opinion, has such a big, broader grasp and hug than, as LDS people, we've allowed him to have. I think it's a great point. I think at the end of the day, we'll learn that Mormonism doesn't hold claim to all of the atonement or all of happiness yeah. or of all the answers. No, not presently anyway. That's probably a great place to end the podcast episode. Okay. Okay. Anything that we didn't talk about you want to hit? Something that we missed? I don't think so. I just want everybody to know that I love God. I love Heavenly Father. I love Jesus Christ. And I will always do my best to serve them and their children. And I think you're doing a fine job. This is part of that process. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time. 
a fascinating story. You're a wonderful person. I'm glad you came out. I'm now going to have to go to the family uh, history library, and I want to see Adam and Eve naked in the picture. <laughs> well, you can. Be, they're uh, up at the very top left and very small. <laughs> Judith Mayer, thanks again for uh, joining us on the podcast. If you have a question for Judy or um, want to discuss anything that we talked about on this podcast and you are following along on the video version, we invite you to uh, type it below. Uh, let's have a real-time conversation about this episode and share your thoughts and feelings. And if you're listening again on the audio version of uh, the podcast on Google, uh, Apple, or iTunes, or uh, iHeartRadio, or any of them, we invite you to hit the subscribe button and you will be given uh, the content as soon as we release it. Again, we want to thank you for joining us on this episode. Uh, we discussed a lot of great things, uh, which were really powerful. And we invite you, as we've discussed in the episode, if you haven't yet, um, to reach out into the LGBT community and better understand uh, the experiences. We have been doing this podcast for eight years. There's uh, over, there's nearly 150 episodes. Uh, and each week we release coming out stories and another section called In My Own Words by um, LGBT members who share their experiences coming out, uh, their experiences within the church, with church leaders, or their own personal journey out of the closet and into a more authentic and honest life. We invite you to read those stories as well. They're always written and published on our Facebook page. If you haven't yet liked our Facebook page, jump on over to Latter Gay Stories uh, on Facebook, uh, our YouTube channel as well, where uh, videos of each of our episodes are posted or online at LatterGayStories.org and by clicking on the resources tab you'll be able to find resources for church leaders to better understand and teach um, the LGBT experience to ward and stake members. But also that's where you'll find our blog where we uh, blog those stories of coming out and uh, the personal experiences of the LGBT community. The Latter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to understand the intersection of sexuality and reality but most importantly, it's where you can, can, can it's where you can continue writing your latter gay story.